Can we thank our choir for leading us this morning? Well, we're continuing our study in Ephesians. We're looking at chapter 5, verses 21 through 33. We're going to take a look at the mystery of marriage. And this is a profound text. And it deals with a profound mystery. Uh, Marriage is an extremely deep subject. And it's too profound to handle in one Sunday, but we're going to give it a try. I will be teaching uh, this passage probably in a five to ten week sermon series at some point in time. So if, if today doesn't answer some of the questions that you might have as we look into this, we will be looking at it much deeper. It is very, very rich and very, very deep and involved. And so it will require a lot of work on your part to stay with the text today. Um, there are advantages, though, to doing an overall view, and we're going to take a look at, the, at this passage from a, from a big-picture perspective and see a few of its important insights along the way. But before we do, I want to talk about how we come to read something, uh, what I like to call filters. I want to talk about filters. In other words, each time you come to a text, you... You, it's, you hope that you can look at it through pure lenses and just see the text for what it is. But that's not how we read almost anything. We come to it and we have filters on. And we have our life experience that we bring to a text. So for example, as we're taking a look at this topic of marriage, some of you may have bad marriages. Or maybe you were raised... Uh, from a couple who had a bad marriage or they they didn't last, they weren't together. And so when you come to this text, you're going to have a filter and when you hear, you know, to submit to one another and love one another, you might think, oh, they're just using one another or they're just, you know, um, they're just actually trying to control one another. So you come to it with that filter. But then on the other hand, you might have a great marriage or you might have been raised in a great marriage and you might be naively optimistic about marriage. And so you come to the text through your own set of filters as well. And then if you look at the flags here, we have 44 flags. They represent 44 different nationalities that actively worship here in this church. So you can imagine the different worldviews we have um, as we approach this topic of marriage. If you come from a traditional culture, you're going to think the purpose of marriage is to fulfill social functions. And so you'll read words like, or hear words like submit, and you'll be, yeah, that's great. But then you'll hear words like love, and you might want to laugh at that when it comes to marriage. Or on the other hand, you might come from a Western individualistic culture where the purpose is to fill your per- to fulfill your personal desires and feelings. And so when you come to this text, you hear the word love and you're like, yes. But then when you see the word submit uh, or headship, you're, no, 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 no. You, you see what I'm, where I'm going? The, of any text in scripture, this is the one people come to with all kinds of filters. And I'm going to beg all of us to lay our filters down and to just receive this text for what it is saying as best as you can. And I do want to make a couple caveats. This is very convicting. And as I uh, was preparing this week for the sermon, uh, it was very difficult for me. And I, uh, you know, talked to my wife last night. We went to bed and I told my wife, you know, I don't know if I can preach this sermon because I'm not doing this text. And, and she said, well, you're better than you think. <laughs> so I was like, okay, that's good. But I want to confess to you, this is an extraordinary call. And um, while I seek and want to be obedient to this text, I find it very difficult for myself. And I can guarantee that, y- that many of you today will find some of what's said maybe even offensive. And it will be very difficult to hear some of this. And I'm asking in advance for your grace and that we can work this text through as a community. 
Don't worry, I will do a longer sermon series on this at another time, and some of the questions that you might leave with today hopefully will get answered more deeply. But again, my request is that I, myself included, would lay down our filters and hear this text. So let me go ahead and just read this passage, and then we'll take a look at it. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit. By the way, before I look at this, you might want to pull out your bulletin. The person doing PowerPoint couldn't come today, so we, we don't have PowerPoint really. You might want to pull out your Bible. There's also a resource, a small group resource in your bulletin that has the text in it. You'll want to follow along on this. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body of which he is the Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In this way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies, for he who loves his wife loves himself. After all, No one ever hated his own body, but he feeds it and he cares for it just as Christ feeds and cares for the church, for we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery. But I'm talking really about Christ and the church here. However, each one of you must also love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must also respect her husband. The word of the Lord. Extraordinary, rich passage. This passage is all about not just marriage in general, it's about a particular type of marriage. This is talking about the Christian model for marriage. That's what this passage is about. The Christian model for marriage. And we're going to take a look at three extraordinarily important insights in this text. Number one, if you have a Christian model, if you're living out a Christian model of marriage, you're going to have a power. Number one, there's a power. Number two, if you're going to live out this Christian model of marriage, you're going to, you're going to have a, it has a particular purpose in mind. It's different from other models of marriage. And believe me, there are other models of marriage. We'll look at those. And then thirdly, we're going to take a look at the fact that a Christian model of marriage ultimately does not point to itself A Christian model of marriage points to Jesus Christ. So we're going to take a look at those three things, one at a time. First, Christian model of marriage has a power, it has a purpose, and it has a pointer. Each one of those. But before we do, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we need your help to um, hear your message to us. We ask that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit, that you would be the teacher today and anoint the words of my mouth and anoint the meditations of our hearts. Lord, as we want to put our filter onto this and react, I I pray that we could receive and hear from you and hear what you have to say. And I pray that it helps glorify not only you, but it helps transform and glorify us. We need your help to hear this. We, We ask for it in Jesus' name. Amen. The Christian model of marriage has, first of all, a power. And I'm going to begin by doing some grammar with you on this text because it's extremely important to see this insight. If you notice in verse 21, there's a verse that says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. It's often called a bridge sentence in between two subjects. And if you were here a couple weeks ago, we talked about verse 18. It says, be filled with the Spirit if you remember that. Be filled with the Spirit. And then so some translations look at this verse as as a bridge verse. So on one hand, you have the, the subject of being filled with the Spirit. And then on the other hand, starting in verse 22, there's a different subject about marriage. 
that takes place. And I want to submit to you that that is wrong. That's a wrong interpretation of what's written in the Greek. What's actually written in the Greek is a very long sentence that starts in verse 18 and ends in verse 24. So this is not a bridge verse in between two subjects. In other words, Paul isn't saying, I'm going to talk about the filling of the Holy Spirit, and here's a bridge verse, and then let's talk about a different subject, marriage. They're one and the same. So literally what is happening here, if you read this text correctly, you're going to come to verse 18, and it's going to say, don't get drunk on wine because you'll be unsafe, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. This is the big command. Be filled with the Holy Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making music in your hearts to God, always giving thanks to God your Father for everything in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. And as an illustration of that submission, let me talk about husbands and wives. And he goes on and on. Do you see? It's not separate. And and if you look at different translations, you'll see, They put that verse maybe up above, they put it down below. I mean, you have to kind of divide it somewhere. But it's crucial to see it's one and the same because what's happening here is this Christian model of marriage is fueled by the filling of the Holy Spirit. It's because you're filled with the Holy Spirit that you can actually do this. And if you're not filled with the Holy Spirit, do not try to do this passage. You will cause great harm to yourself and others. This is extremely important to understand. And then secondly, in verse 21, it says, submit, it has the word submit, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. And then in verse 22, it also has the word submit, right? Wives, submit to your husbands. But in the Greek, there is no word submit in verse 22. It's literally borrowed from verse 21. So it literally says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ, wives, to your husbands. So for readability's sake, they've borrowed that That verb to submit again. So what does this mean and why is this so critical to understand? It is critical to your understanding of this text. There are no divisions. You know, we we have numbers and we put paragraphs, but in the Greek, there are no divisions. And it, it changes everything. Again, Paul's not talking about the Holy Spirit, and then switching subjects. He's talking about one thing. He is saying that the Christian model of marriage comes out of being filled with the Holy Spirit. If you're filled with the Holy Spirit, this is what your marriage will look like. Let me try to apply this. It talks about, in this text, it it quotes the Old Testament reading about marriage that a man will leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife. And for those who are called to marriage, and not everyone is called to marriage, the Bible certainly celebrates uh, singlehood, Um, but for those who are called to marriage, it's a general call. God wants everyone in marriage to leave their father and mother and then make a lifelong commitment to that spouse And God wants everyone in marriage to cleave. It literally means to glue, to interlock, to be filled with passion with one another. But beyond that, this verse is not, this passage is not a regulation for every marriage. This passage is a particular challenge for Christian believers. This is, you don't want to use this verse against just anyone, right? Don't apply it to people who are not Christians. It will not work. In other words, this verse is not telling the world how their marriages should go. It's a challenge to Christians who are filled with the Spirit. Do you see this? Paul is not calling all women of the world to submit to all men. That is not what this passage is saying. In fact, he's not calling all the wives of the world to submit to all the husbands. What this passage is saying is if and only if you're filled with the Holy Spirit, if you're a committed Christian, can you do something as wild and different and radical and profound as what he's going to describe in this text. Do you hear that? 
None of this will make sense unless you really get this. The Christian model of marriage has a power. It's powered by the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Jesus Christ. And without it, do not try this verse at home. It, the Holy Spirit is a prereq, prerequisite for doing this. Okay. Christian model of marriage has a power. Number two, a Christian model of marriage has a purpose. What makes a Christian model of marriage different from other marriages is its purpose. What is it for? What is marriage for? What do you think marriage is for will determine everything about it. I find it staggering that people run into marriage and you ask them what is the purpose of marriage and they can't tell you. Something as, as important as marriage is and we haven't thought through what is the purpose of it. But before we look at this passage in the Christian model of marriage, I want to submit to you two models of marriage in general. And I, in, in preparation and study for this sermon, I read this book called Marriage, a History. It was fascinating. And really, most uh, cultural historians agree that there are two basic general uh, purposes of marriage throughout history. And I'll try my best to, to simplify this. It's very complex. But basically, this book talks about the, what I will call a traditional model of marriage. A, it, it's the old way. It's the ancient way. From the very beginning of the history of marriage itself, this is the way it has gone. The purpose of marriage in a traditional model for marriage is you get married to fulfill social functions. You get married because, for economic reasons, for social reasons, maybe even political reasons. If you're a king in Israel and you want to have peace with Egypt, you marry the Pharaoh's daughter, right? It keeps you safe. Um, if you want to raise yourself up economically, you find someone who's, who has more money than you do. If you want children, you find a spouse who, who seems to be able to, to produce good, healthy children. If you want an heir. Does that make sense? The traditional model of marriage is all about commitment. You are committed for life in this model and, and, you, and it's for social obligations. And that is why when you look at this traditional model of marriage, you will never see divorce. Divorce doesn't happen in that model of marriage because the purpose is commitment and social obligation and duty. So, of course, they would never think of love being a part of, of, of this model. Uh, you marry for social obligation. If love comes with it, great, but you don't expect it. You marry for those social obligations, and if you're not getting love, no problem. You can have a mistress on the side. You see, marriage is not about love. It's about commitment, and it's about that economic and social uh, well-being and, and improving your life. Does this make sense? That's just general. It, it goes in so much detail. That is the general uh, approach to marriage from the beginning of the history and we see it today still and now literally there has been a shift the, the, there's been a cultural consensus that has happened it started after the enlightenment for the really basically the last 200 years 1800s 1900s it, this book is subtitled how love conquered marriage so no longer is it out of social obligation and duty it's now, and this is relatively recent, it's for love. Or what I would more accurately call passion and desire. Kind of eros love, right? You get married because of some sexual chemistry that you have with someone. And you know, that's why you get married. And you know, if, they commit, if they're committed, well, that would be nice. But you don't expect them to be committed. That's why you see many divorces in the last 200 years because, of course, what happens when you fall out of love? When you fall out of love? Well, that's the whole reason for being married is love. And, and I mean, how many times have you heard that? Well, I fell out of love. And so there's no marriage. You see, there's social obligation on one side. And then on the other side, the new approach in the last 200 years, you marry out of love. Now, they look different, don't they? 
Don't they look different as I've explained them? They are not. They are not different. As different as they seem, rock bottom, they're not different at all because the purpose of both this traditional model and this new model, the purpose of marriage is to fulfill me. That's it. The purpose of marriage is not to serve my spouse. The purpose is to find a spouse that can get me what I want and get me where I want to be. And they both would find, they both would agree that commitment and love are incompatible. Well, you can have commitment, but love uh, sometimes comes. You can have love, but commitment uh, sometimes comes. They're mutually incompatible is what they, they believe. They agree on that. They're rock bottom the same. The, the purpose of marriage is to fulfill me. And the Bible says, and your hearts know that we have to have both. We have to have both. And we long for, for both. This passage quotes Genesis chapter 2. It says the husband will leave his parents and will cleave. It literally means glue. He will cleave means your passion, your love together. And the two will become one flesh. And I want to take a look at this idea this marriage that God calls us all to is a one fleshness. In other words, these two things of commitment and of love have to come together and they can come together if you have a different purpose for marriage. If you go down that way, there's no way. If you go down this way, there's no way. You have to have a different purpose of marriage. Do you know what the purpose of marriage is according to this text and this passage? The Christian model of marriage is this, and it is the opposite of what you heard. The Christian model of marriage is that you serve your spouse with a vision for their future glory. It is totally opposite. You, it's not what's in it for me. You serve your spouse with a vision for their future glory. Glory. Now, someone's hopefully saying, okay, but how does this work? How does this work? And it's captured there in verse 21 when it says, submit to one another. I'd like to take a look and unpack what this means. Submit to one another is a very different approach than getting what you want from one another. The whole idea is to serve one another rather than getting what you want out of it. So let me try to break this this idea down, this, this little phrase, submit to one another in three ways. We, we need to submit to one another's needs. We need to submit to one another's differences. Thank you for, for doing that. We need to submit to one another's glory. First of all, again, the purpose of marriage is, is to serve, to submit to one another for their future glory. So number one, submit to one another's needs. The word submit here means to place under. So if someone is serving you, you know how they place under it and they carry your food to you? They're placing themselves under and they're literally lifting something up. Or if they're serving you, they're lifting you up. It's also a military word which means a lower rank as well. Bottom line, the rule of thumb that this passage is advocating for marriage is you always serve the needs of your spouse before your own. That is the rule of thumb in a Christian marriage. But try, you can't do this without the Holy Spirit. Do you see that? Don't try to do this without the Holy Spirit because you can't. The rule of thumb is always, 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 always serve the needs of your spouse before your own. And now someone's got to be out there saying, well, what does this mean? Do you mean that someone can just walk all over me? If I submit myself to someone else, serve their needs, what are, what are they going to do? They're going to walk all over me. And again, the rule of thumb is to submit to their needs. Does that person need to walk all over you? If that person is filled with the Spirit and their goal is Christ-likeness, do you need to let them walk all over you? Absolutely not. Is that going to help them become more Christ-like? Absolutely not. And therefore, one of the best ways that you can indicate whether you have a biblical submission versus a 
Selfish submission is if conflict is in your relationship. If you have healthy conflict in your relationship, more than likely you are living out a biblical submission. If there's no conflict in your relationship, more than likely you either are, you know, supernaturally blessed with compatibility, which does happen very rarely, or you're selfishly submissive. And let me try to give you an illustration of this. If you never confront your spouse, do you know why? It's because you have put your your need, right? What's in it for me? Your need for peace and comfort above that person's need for truth and becoming better than who they are. Do you see that? That's called selfish submission. Biblical submission is helping that person with what they need to become more Christ-like. Selfish submission means you're not going to ever confront them And why won't you confront them? Because you want to keep peace. Okay. I've heard this numerous times. You know, I've given and given and given. And you know, I'm sick of it. Now it's time that I give to me. Have you ever heard that? Have you ever said that? (laughs) I've given and given and given. I'm sick of it. When, When am I going to give to me? I want to give to me. Um, that, and I want to say this as sensitively as I can, a person would only say that if they have been selfishly submissive. In other words, if you've been submissive because you want to feel virtuous about it, or more than likely you want to be submissive because you want to keep the peace in the relationship, you have been selfishly submissive and eventually you will explode and ruin your marriage. You have to submit Not blindly, but to the person's needs to be like Christ. Again, this is for Christians, not for everybody. Those who are filled with the Spirit, you submit to their needs to be like Christ. Secondly, you need to submit to the differences. And this is a hot topic, so I pray for your grace with me here. Notice that the husbands and the wives don't get the same verbs. The husbands are called to love, The wives are called to, what? Respect. The husbands are called to give. The wives are called to submit. Now, there is an overarching command that we submit to one another. We're all supposed to mutually submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. However, if you look down there in verse 23, it talks, let me find this. It says, husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Pardon me. Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord in verse 22. Verse 23. For the husband is the head of the wife. Now again, filters are going to come up like crazy on this. Let's walk this through together. For the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church, his body of which he is the Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also the wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Talking about headship. This word has been debated many times. Um, It really means authority. Some people say it means the source of life. It can mean that, but even if it does mean that, it still means authority. And so what the Bible is saying as a principle is that the man in a spirit-filled marriage is the head of that marriage. In other words, the man has authority of that in that marriage. Now, right away, this is where our filters are going to come up, especially for those in the West. And they're going to say something like this. Well, wait, wait a minute. Doesn't that open a person up to abuse? And I'm going to say, yes, absolutely. It opens that person up for the potential of abuse. And that's why there are so many protections around this. And it's why it's so critical to see it starts with being filled with the Holy Spirit. Because if you're not filled with the Holy Spirit, don't do this. You will abuse. Does that make sense? You need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. 
And so there's all this protection around, which is why I love to preach line by line through books, because we can pick and choose and pull this verse out and do incredible damage. But there's all these protections around this verse as to what authority actually means. And it's amazing. And every woman, if they, if they had a man who was truly living this out and was spirit-filled, would be thanking God. It says that the husband and the wife must leave and become one flesh. Now let's take a look at this whole idea of one fleshness. And I want to take a look at this idea of headship in light of the one fleshness of marriage. Physically speaking... A, man and a, a male and a female body interlock. Physically speaking, they literally interlock. A man moves out and into and toward, and a woman receives. And what the Bible says <clears throat> is your, <clears throat> your body, your physical body, is a mirror of what is happening ontologically and existentially within yourself. For a man and for a woman. So in other words, just as physically a man moves towards a woman, existentially a man has a need to move towards the woman. And just as physically the woman interlocks in the one fleshness is what we're talking about, she needs to receive not only physically, she also needs to, to receive existentially as well. C.S. Lewis illustrates this with dancing. He calls marriage, a Christian marriage, by the way, the great dance. And are you dancers out there? Any dancers? No one dances. Okay, Whew. good. Then I won't make a fool out of myself because I'm not the greatest dancer. Um, if you've ever line danced, you know what that's like. I move this foot and the person next to you moves the same right foot, right? And then you move that foot, they move the same foot, right? That's a person who is not married to you. That's a person who's shoulder to shoulder. Maybe they're same sex, maybe someone who you aren't committed to, right? They line dance, right? One time. There's no complication to this, no compliment. Marriage, biblically, is like, an intim is like intimate dancing. And when you intimately dance, you hold each other close and you look into each other's eyes when you're dancing. And when I move my left foot toward the woman, what happens if she moves her left foot toward me? We kick each other's in the shins, right? doesn't work. We just hurt each other. But what C.S. Lewis captures in The Great Dance is he says, when, that, when, you, when you move toward with your left foot, there's, a, there's something that needs to happen in the one fleshness where the woman needs to receive and complement your actions with the opposite foot to give room to you, and there you will experience deep maleness and you will experience deep femaleness in one fleshness. Does that make sense? So, how do you get this one fleshness? Here is a principle, a practical principle that is going to sound so simple, yet it is extraordinarily profound. We in terms of headship, we get no details. I'm going to say it again. In terms of male authority in a Christian marriage, there are no details whatsoever what headship means. You have to mutually submit to one another and figure it out. We get no details on what headship and authority means in a Christian marriage. And one of the dangers of putting this passage in what I would call an unthinking conservative person, it kind of goes like this. I've heard this so many times. You know, an unthinking conservative will get this passage and he'll say, wives, submit to your husbands. Yeah, I like that. Wives, submit to their husbands. You know what that means? And, and I, I stand back and I go, yeah, tell me, what does that mean? Well, wives, it means that the wife should, should stay at home and not work. And then I say, well, what about Proverbs 31, where the woman is an extraordinary provider, an incredible businesswoman? Woman. What about Jesus' ministry was paid for by women? Well, uh, the women should stay home and take care of the kids. That's what it means. That's what headship means. And I said, well, what about the next part of this chapter? 
where it says that a father and a mother are supposed to mutually raise their children. Oh, it means that a man is supposed to cook out on the grill and the woman's supposed to cook inside the house. I mean, it just gets crazy. There are no details as to what headship is about. There are none. You have to mutually figure that out yourself. What people are unthinking conservatives are really thinking, talking about is their preferences. Their preferences. I prefer to have my wife stay at home. You know, the wife has preferences too. Some wives also say, I prefer to stay at home. There are no details to headship. The Bible affirms the principle of male headship to, to allow for that deep interlocking of one fleshness in marriage. And so it affirms that, affirms the maleness, and it affirms the femaleness. But it does not give you details as to what headship is all about. Therefore, a husband can never say, I have authority, therefore, give me a glass of water, make my sandwich, make my lunch, make my breakfast. Because you see, in this passage, if you read it, it says that the husband's authority, his headship, is like Jesus Christ. In other words, it's like Christ. It was like how Christ was with the church. And my question to you is, what was Christ like with the church? Christ died to himself to serve the church. He died to himself to serve. So a man's a th- a male authority in a Christian spirit-filled marriage means that he can never use his authority selfishly. Never. That is not what Jesus Christ did. That's not the model. And whenever a husband in a spirit-filled marriage uses his authority selfishly, it's the right of a submissive wife to call that man to greater glory. But, again... You can negotiate all the details. Can I share with you how I've negotiated the details in my marriage? <clears throat> and I'm going to say this is not the paradigm. Please don't use me as the model of, it just works in my marriage. Okay, this is, we, uh, you can't debate the general principle. I, as the male in a spirit-filled Christian marriage, I am the head of my, my family. I'm the head of my, my wife. We affirm that. But again, no details. We have to figure out mutually what that means. And here is what it means for my wife and I. As the head, we live our lives out day to day in partnership. But if there is ever a time when we need to make a decision and it's critical and time bound and we both disagree, it's going to go my way. And I will suffer the consequences of the decision. And my wife, as a biblically submissive woman, if I use that authority to serve myself, will come at me tooth and nail and challenge my glory as a submissive wife serving my needs. Here's another example. If someone comes in and robs our house, or if there's a strange noise in the house. There's absolutely no question about it. We've already discussed this. I'm the one who's going to go down. We don't debate, oh, I heard another noise. Can you go do it? I'm tired tonight. How about you? It is never a debate. I don't know if you remember that story of the rat that we found. Guess who went and found that rat? It was me. (laughs) There's no question about it. If there's a boat and it only holds four people, I'm going to be the one that stays. I will die first. That's what headship looks like in my family. You might say, well, that's, other than that, it's, there's not much there. You might say, well, that's not very much, but it has been enough for me to get in touch with the maleness that I have. It has been enough to get my wife in touch with her, her receiving femaleness. And it has helped us in unity towards one fleshness. <clears throat> By the way, in the last eight years, we've moved houses twice. No, we moved ho- we've moved houses every two years. I've switched jobs three times. We've moved from the continent of the United States to here. We've had three sons. And can I tell you, I have never once used my authority to deal with a, a dis- disagreement. Not one time. <clears throat> Lastly, We submit to each other's glory, not just our needs and our differences, but to each other's glory. And I'll try to be brief here. All of a sudden, in the middle of this passage, Paul starts talking about Jesus Christ. And he begins to look, as he's thinking about marriage, what is the marriage like 
for Jesus because we're married to him. We're united with him. So what is the purpose of marriage for Jesus? And this is it. Do you know what the purpose of Jesus is? Do you know why he incarnated, God incarnated himself on earth? Do you know why he died for you? Do you know why he suffered? Do you know why he was risen? Do you know why he ascended? Do you know why he did this for you? As being married to you? He did it to present you radiant, unblemished, spotless, without any wrinkles. He did it to present you to the Heavenly Father glorious and beautiful. That's why he came. It's a radically different example and approach to marriage. So what does this mean? What does this mean? If you're not married and you're thinking about getting married, it totally changes how you choose a spouse. See, there's the old approach, which is you kind of figure out, um, you know, who makes some good money and and you can kind of, Um, raise your economic status up or maybe you want to marry into a good family. Basically, it's to get something that you want to improve your life. There's that approach. There's the other approach, which is basically you have sexual chemistry. Um, But here's, here's a radically different approach. Basically, it's when you see someone and you long to serve them for their future glory. When you long to come alongside someone and serve them for your future glory. How do you know who should be your spouse? Here's one very small rule of thumb. It's if that person treats, uh, comes to you and that person makes you want to climb up. If that person wants you to be better, they will accept you but they will also reject the sin that's there. If the person wants to glor- you to become more Christ-like, more glorious, that is a good rule of thumb for who to marry. These other two approaches will fail you. Lastly, again, the Christian model of marriage has a power of the Holy Spirit. It has a purpose to serve your spouse for their future glory. And it has a pointer. And this is just as important as the first principle. It has a pointer. In other words, how do we do this text? Marriage is to be a pointer. And it says in that verse 20, 21, submit to one another, what? Out of reverence for Christ. And the word reverence, I don't know, when you think of reverence, I think of kind of shh. Reverence. But the word in Greek here is fear. Submit to one another in fear of Christ. It's a glorious, intense word. Fear means awe. Awe inspired love. It means total amazement. So the whole reason that we submit to one another, the whole reason that our marriages are to be serving for one another's glory is out of your awe and amazement for Jesus Christ. We submit to one another because of our awe. In other words, you have the power of the Holy Spirit and you're filled with an awe for Christ and what he has done for you. And when you are filled with an awe of what Christ has done for you, you will not look to your future spouse or your spouse as a savior. This verse does not say submit to one another out of reverence for one another. It does not say submit to one another out of reverence for one another. It says submit to one another out of awe of Christ. So, for example, if some, you know, maybe you've heard this, someone's gotten in marriage and, you know, they finally got married and they're like, oh, I'm now accepted. I'm now finally, someone wants to marry me. I want to, I'm finally loved. Someone finally loves me. You are submitting to one another out of reverence for one another. Not out of reverence for Christ. In other words, what you're really doing is getting from that person what you want to feel good about yourself. What happens when you when you don't when marriage isn't a pointer to the awe of Christ is it will make marriage an idol. And when you make marriage an idol, it will ruin your marriage, it will ruin your life and it will ruin the life of the person you're with. Let me give you three examples and then we'll truly close. 
One example. Say you're not married, but you're devastated by it. I'm not married. Oh, what's wrong with me? I want to be married, right? Do you believe in Jesus Christ? Do you truly trust him? Are you in awe of Jesus Christ? Because the fact is, he will present you far more beautiful than your thousand dollar dress will ever get you here on earth. He will present you as pure crystal before the throne of God and marry you. He is the only spouse that will truly fulfill you and he longs to be your spouse. So even for the, peop- even for the people who have good marriages, no marriage will truly fulfill you. And if you're devastated that you're not marriage, you have made marriage itself an idol when you should be turning your eyes towards what marriage points you to, which is the awe of Jesus Christ. He is your spouse. The second example, what if you're married, but you're married to a non-Christian? Now, I know you've got to be careful with this. I know it can be hard, and I've heard things like this. You know, my life's great, but oh, if, I, if, if I was married to a Christian, then I would really be fulfilled. If I, was, if I finally get married, married to a Christian, I'd, finally be, I'd be perfectly fulfilled. You're making marriage an idol. You're making it what it was never intended to be. You're forgetting that marriage does not point to itself Again, a spirit-filled Christian marriage points to Christ. It points beyond itself. And until you allow marriage to point beyond yourself to Christ, you will be lousy in marriage. And then lastly, what if you're not a Christian and you're just not even sure why you came today? (laughs) Why am I listening to this? I'm not even a Christian. I'm not married. I don't even want to listen to this. What I believe God wants to tell you today is that you need a God who is a lover. You won't find that in any other religion. You need a God who is your lover and who can penetrate deep into your soul and provide that kind of love. And if you don't see God as your lover, you will make gods out of your lovers or out of fear of marriage, you will have nothing more than sexual encounters You need a God who loves you as a spouse. Marriage is a pointer. Do you see what's going on? Paul's talking about being filled with the Holy Spirit and then you mutually submit. And as an illustration, let's talk about a marriage between a husband and a wife, which is actually... I'm ac- he says, it's actually, this is a profound mystery. I'm actually talking about Christ and the church. In other words, what he's talking about in this whole passage is this. When you look at a Christian marriage, you should see an illustration of Jesus in the church. Do you see why I told my wife, I don't know if I can preach this sermon? When you look at a Christian marriage, it should be an illustration of of Jesus and the church. The man as the head dies to serve and present the church radiant and beautiful. It makes marriage epic. It makes marriage an adventure. It's no longer drudgery and it's no longer something that's unstable. It is a grand adventure because it points to Jesus Christ. May God bless you. Heavenly Father, would you help our marriages? May they be filled with the Holy Spirit. May, they, may we live them out, uh, serving each other for each other's glory. May we, may we see these marriages, especially in our church, may each of our marriages actually be a reflection and point us to Jesus Christ and the church and the deep love he has for his body. Lord, we thank you for this profound message for us, for those who have ears to hear, hear. In Jesus' name, amen.